at, at UNESCO. And this workshop is organized, as you'll see from the, the page on your that, that we distributed here. It's co-organized by UNESCO, Global Partners and Associates, Council of Europe, and Article 19. Uh, and we have speakers from those organizations. So I will start off with a few remarks, uh, and then we'll turn over to two of the key authors of this publication, which is here, and I hope you have copies. And then we'll go to the rest of our panelists, and we'll have to keep it quite tight because of time. If you look at the back of your, your page on the, that, I, that I distributed, you'll see the order of speakers. We're going to change it slightly, uh, but uh, I'll deal with that when we come to that. Okay. So let me welcome you to this particular workshop uh, on Internet privacy and freedom of expression. As I mentioned, we're fortunate to have two of the authors of the publication right here, and they're going to speak immediately after me. And we have lots of other discussants, and we hope to take some discussion from the floor as well. The topic that we're dealing with, Internet privacy, is very, very topical, as evident from this recent uh, front page of the International Herald Tribune. This was last week. I just happened to pick up the International Herald Tribune while I was busy preparing for this workshop. And this is the front page of a pretty important newspaper. The first one is the Greeks in uproar about the Swiss list. This is the, the list of which Greeks have got bank accounts in, in Switzerland, <laughs> uh, which of course is, is private information, and there's been a court case about that. And the second story here is that it says angry birds and others collect data on app users. And then there's even a turn and it says privacy page. Th so the front page of, of a major paper, two really important stories about this issue. So uh, let me just tell you where we come from. UNESCO, representing 195 member states, is mandated to promote the free flow of ideas by word and image. And this is seen historically as a key prerequisite to building lasting peace. Today, UNESCO continues to advance this mission, including through a commitment to a free, open, and accessible Internet space. And this is part of our broader efforts to promote a comprehensive freedom of expression, both online and offline. Now, the book that we, UNESCO, are launching today points out this network digital era enables a lot of new things, new ways to collect information, new kinds of information that can be collected, new amounts of information that are collected, new techniques of analyzing that information, and new ways in which the information is used. So this is a, a game changer in a way. And I'd just like you to consider briefly the example of your mobile phone. Suppose you sent a photograph of yourself at last night's party at the palace. You sent it to your Facebook page on your mobile phone. Well, one can keep counting and counting the information entailed in this simple act. First, there's the photograph itself and the content that you're sharing with your Facebook friends. Hope hopefully, information that will not incriminate your reputation. <laughs> then there's the electronic record of the transfer that's held by, your, by the internet service provider, the mobile service provider which will also include your SIM, uh, your SIM number, your time, location, and the IMEI number on your phone. Then, number three, the company that's made the operating system could have, been, could have organized to take a record, such as we know Apple's do, uh, a record of the use and location of your phone and send that back to its headquarters. The company that made the phone might be implicated as well in the fact that your use may be evident on the device itself or anybody who knows how to inspect it. The provider of the particular app that you have downloaded to interface with Facebook may also have a system that reports on your usage. And let's not start on the electronic metadata that's nowadays embedded in the photo that you have just sent. And let's not talk further about the friend who copies your photo off Facebook, emails it to another, and eventually it ends up in the hands of a policeman who's building up evidence to blackmail you into spying on a colleague. <laughs> anyway, this is all hypothetical, but in this mega information context, it's critical, as one can see, with so much information to reinforce the protection of privacy, which is a fundamental right that can impact on other freedoms, such as freedom of expression, association, and belief. And that raises the question of who should reinforce the protection of privacy, the role of the diverse actions in protection, the user, the intermediaries, the authorities, in that example of my, my, the cell phone where there are at least six or seven layers of, of information uh, uh, being generated, what is the role of each of those in protecting privacy? The focus of this study, which is a global survey, 
highlights that there are different interpretations of the concept of privacy and that there are complex overlaps between the concept of privacy with the concept of data protection and the concept of anonymity, which are three distinct but often conflated concerns. This booklet also examines key aspects regarding the regulatory landscape in many regions of the world and it analyzes the challenges that relate to discrepancies in legislation pertaining to online and offline spheres and it unpacks the complexity linked to national and international jurisdictions. As the book warns us, we should remain alert to the fact that attempts to safeguard privacy online can sometimes undermine legitimate freedom of expression. Privacy regimes can be abused to maintain secrecy in regard to information that really deserves to be laid out in the sterilizing, sterilization of sunlight. The classic example is where those people exposed by investigative journalism invoke claims of violations of their privacy, even though the unearthing of the information concerned is more often than not in the public interest. What this study points out is that in an interconnected world, we should also remember that the same model that works to balance privacy protection with free expression in one country can be emulated with negative impact on freedom of expression in another country. At the same time, the book also reminds us that very often poor regimes and protected freedom of expression are accompanied by poor privacy regimes as well. The book provides some guidance and suggestions on how governments can adequately ensure legal protection of both the right to privacy and the right to freedom of expression, especially when they come into competition. It further explores self-regulatory initiatives in the private sector, the user uh, roles, and civil society-led efforts to protect privacy and anonymity, and makes reference to particular case studies. We at UNESCO, we hope that you will not keep your reading and your re-reading of this book as part of your private information, but instead that you will contribute widely to the public sphere by contributing what you think about it and the way it, co it covers these issues of privacy and freedom of expression. You can get the online version uh, of this book and I'll give you the URL uh, sh at the end of the session. Uh, I'm certain that these discussions will serve as very valuable input into tomorrow's main session focusing on security, openness and privacy over the internet as they relate to human rights and access to knowledge and I will report to that session uh, many of the insights that arise from this. So thank you for that, and let me now hand over to some of the key brains behind the work. Um, the first person uh, is, I think, well known to Andrew Pudafat, uh, who is uh, the founder and head of Global Partners and Associates, who do an enormous amount of work in human rights policy and transparency, including with the UNESCO, Ford Foundation, and so on. Andrew is previously a director of Article 19. So Andrew, let me hand over to you, and then afterwards I'll introduce your, your co-conspirator. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Guy. And uh, firstly, I, I should say that this publication is very much a team effort, uh, not just Ben and myself and Natalia Torres and Dixie, who can't be here, but also Toby Mendel, known to many of you as a very eminent international human rights lawyer, plus a very strong advisory group and a whole range of people. So this is really the, a collective product of a, of a large number of minds. Um, and I hope it doesn't have the downsides of being written by committee, but the upsides of being the product of uh, a collaborative intelligence. I think one of the interesting things for me about privacy as a human right is that most people regard it as an extremely important uh, feature of their lives, the right to keep aspects of our lives to ourselves. It's essential to our personal integrity, but it's extremely hard to define what privacy is and where the boundaries of privacy end. It clearly has a dual aspect. It relates partly to those things about ourselves that we believe and we have a reasonable expectation should be private, but it also relates to the way that third parties handle information that they hold about us. So it's an aspect about us and an aspect about the way information about us is handled and treated uh, by others. It's also very interesting if you look back at the literature, the, the term privacy is relatively recent in modern history. This wasn't something that you see extensively discussed and argued about in medieval literature or ancient Arabic literature or many other cultures. Really, the, the, the modern concept of privacy emerges in the United States in the 19th century in an argument about the use of photographs of people in newspapers without their permission. So I think the first thing I'd say is 
the debate about privacy has always been technology related. And the way that privacy presents itself as a challenge always follows different technological developments. And so it's no surprise that the internet changes the context in which we think about privacy and have to think through how privacy is protected. It's also important to say, and I think this is a very big concern for UNESCO, that privacy has a complex relationship with freedom of expression. It's not straightforward. And UNESCO as an organization that defends freedom of expression has to think about the way it deals with privacy very carefully. I mean, clearly on the one hand, the right for it to be anonymous in your communications with people has played a very critical part at different parts in human history in the struggle for democracy and remains a very key part of, of democratic struggles in the world today because it enables people to challenge powerful governments without necessarily having very bad repercussions. On the other hand, there's no doubt that very powerful people, very powerful interests will seek to use privacy laws or privacy protections to guard themselves against investigation of their activities, including activities that will be illegitimate or even illegal. So is it, there's a constant need to balance and a tension between privacy and freedom of expression, which is something that has exercised human rights courts and human rights thinkers for many, many years. And it's a delicate balance. And how we manage that, manage that balance is very important for both the right to privacy and the right to free expression. As Guy said, I think we think there are five or six areas where the Internet has fundamentally changed the way we think about privacy. Firstly, it enables the collection of new types of personal information. The Internet enables people to understand my habits, my friendship networks, my personal patterns of behavior in a way that wasn't possible with other technologies. Secondly, it facilitates the collection and identification of personal information through unique IP addresses and geolocation software. I can be traced to particular locations and all kinds of attributes brought back to me that in the past, again, technologically would have been difficult. difficult. Thirdly, it creates new capacities for both governments and particularly private actors to collect and store and analyze vast amounts of personal information. It has created what has been known as big data, which is regarded as the oil of the 21st century, the vast amounts of information that companies can now harvest and use for commercial purposes. That's something we haven't seen before. And therefore, it creates new opportunities for the commercial use of personal data in exchange for the free use of services. And essentially, the Faustian pact that's offered us is if you use a whole range of internet services and products you get this stuff for free, and we get this stuff about you that we can then use. And that's the deal that consciously or unconsciously we're being offered. And finally, it creates big new challenges for protection and regulation of privacy, given the transnational nature of the internet and the very complex and different nature of different national legal systems. We've charted some sample countries from China to France to the United States, and you can see they're very, very different jurisdictions. And so companies providing services or people operating across international jurisdictions have to cope with very, very different systems of rules and procedures. That creates a great deal of legal ambiguity for organizations operating in the transnational sphere in trying to understand the different ways that privacy should be handled. So those, it seems to me, are the big overarching challenges. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Ben Wagner, to go through in some more detail the internet environment in relation to privacy, and then I'll come back to some of the key recommendations we're making in the paper. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. And let me just introduce Ben Wagner. He's an associate of Global Partners and Associates, uh, and he's an academic researcher at the university, uh, European University Institute in, in, Flo in Florence, and he coordinates the Dynamic Coalition on Freedom of Expression and Freedom of the Media at the IGF. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, Guy, for the introduction and Andrew for the wonderful opening remarks. Um, I think there's an important distinction to be made between the conversations we've been having, even... Is that better? Yes, I hope. Um, I think there's an important distinction to be made between even the conversations that have been had four or five years ago about what the Internet is and the Internet as we see it today 
there have been in the last 10, 15 years enormous technological and also economic shifts in the way the internet, whatever it is or whatever it's called, functions and acts. And that has extraordinary important consequences. We were just mentioning now big data, but also various different other products which relate extraordinarily to privacy and freedom of expression. And if you just imagine the internet, as at least some of the people here in the room will have experienced it in the mid-1990s, and the internet as it exists today, it's almost impossible to compare the two concepts that you see behind the screen in front of you, because it's so extraordinarily different. And what you then don't see is all of the technical shifts, but all of the business models that are changing behind that as well. So the, in the mid-1990s, the business model that drove the internet was a completely different one than exists today. And the rise of advertising-driven and based services is so extraordinary and has such important consequences for the way privacy works. But you see an increasing shift from a, a more ISP-driven model or a more model that is driven by, by content owners increasingly towards advertising. And that has different shifts and different pushes. I don't want to go into too much detail now. But it, again, if you imagine at the basic level what the internet was that you saw in the 1990s and the, what's on your screen today, there's an incredible shift that has taken place. And this has considerable consequences for privacy. So if you look at the, the main shifts that we see and we believe to have identified with the help of the many people involved in this report, the, the first key and obvious shift is a focus away from the classic mechanisms of discovery and increasingly towards search. So I'm not sure how often, again, this may be different for people in the room, but increasingly DNS is no longer an obvious path to discovery of websites, but it's basically search that becomes the first and most immediate portal, which again has uh, important consequences, not just for getting to websites, but also for the search queries that people enter inadvertently and straightforwardly into search engine boxes. I'm sure that uh, many people here will have experienced copying and pasting something into a search box and then later realizing they perhaps didn't want this information to be data mined. It's too late by the point you've hit search. At the same time, there's an increasing shift towards social networking, and the, the use of the Internet revolves essentially to a large extent around search and around social networking. Those are the two main platforms. And it should be noted at this point that these platforms are not a particularly pluralistic market with numerous actors involved, but there are a few key actors who are involved in very specific ways and as a result have access to enormous amounts of data that previously did not exist. We didn't have that amount of data collected in one place possibly at any point in human history, but certainly not in the last five or in the last ten years. These are shifts that have happened in a very recent sense. And this links to a wider trend within the industry that is, again, familiar to, I believe, many people in this room known as cloud computing. Now, again, cloud, as, as it's called now, is not a particularly new trend. It's been around for some time. But the collection of enormous amounts of personal data, but also of data in general, on hosts, which can then be mined, cross-linked, explored, is a very important and differentiating trend. And here we have strong links to national legislation. So I'd just like to mention very briefly one case, which is the, the hacking of SciWorld. Um, SciWorld is a Korean provider of various different online services, also social networks. And it's so popular that in Korea, we didn't want to go to the, to the exact uh, highest percentage we could have given, because um, statistics about Internet users and Internet access are always slightly um, shifted back and forth, and it's never quite clear how accurate they are. But it's relatively reasonable to say that at least 85% of all Internet users in Korea had their personal information stolen several years ago. And this is particularly important because there was government legislation at the time which forced those users to provide their real names. There was a real name policy in Korea. And as a result of this, uh, this theft, this hack, it's one thing would be a case if there was already, if you just imagine the, the whole of the, the, the US Facebook accounts being stolen. It's one thing if this is data that is of better or worse quality and it's hard to identify. But if you know that this is extremely high quality data, if you know that this is extremely precise data, this also makes it particularly valuable to be attacked and stolen. And this is some of the challenges that are starting to emerge in the new online environment, that you have enormous amounts of data centered in one place that then interacts with national legislation, which then becomes attractive to a third party and once it's stolen, even though the Korean Supreme Court has taken a very close look at this, uh, this legal, uh, uh, this law in uh, South Korea, uh, it's still the case that the data has been stolen. The data is now gone. This is not a choice that the 85% the of uh, Korean internet users when the data was stolen last year now has. And it's going to be extremely difficult to get that data back, should that idea ever be possible. 
Then, of course, there are increasing uses of various different kinds of technical tools and techniques. I'd refer specifically to deep packet inspection now because it's an area where I've done some more research. But in a more general sense, you see across the network an increase in the capacity of the network to both store data and discipline users in various different ways. So from, as I've already mentioned, deep packet inspection, storage on the cloud, but also various different techniques that exist on the phones and on the devices that are being used to access the, the internet that are also increasingly being used to store data. At the same time, these devices are also increasingly becoming not just internet access devices, but provide a whole range of functions and techniques. Um, this goes specifically to geolocation technologies, but also other technologies there. So in the past, it wasn't common that an internet accessing device was also uh, integrated with a microphone. Now the fact that a microphone is integrated means that all sorts of other forms of surveillance and data gathering are possible in ways that previously weren't imaginable. And this again links into the shift towards a more mobile internet which is being used. Now um, I realize that um, we shouldn't necessarily be um, going into too much detail on the specific uses in certain parts of the world, but I do think it's important to mention that smartphones have become one of the key entry points for law enforcement but for also other actors and for third parties who want to get access to information about the not just the let's say the possible crimes that individuals may have committed but to to dig dirt on activists to find ways in which uh, information can be exploited about individuals and in a more general sense to just get as deeply as possible into the life worlds of individuals and so the smartphone as an artifact, but also as a very real thing, has become one of the first things that will be taken away from people when they are arrested or detained. And that even happens in places which occasionally also tend to organize IGFs. So moving away slightly from the end user devices, we're moving slightly closer to the expansion of what have become in a private sense, but also in a public sense, the proliferation of public databases and private databases on end users. And because we have a, a vast shift towards um, identification techniques. Now, the first response to all this is, ah, we need to look at the cookie directive. Well, yes, uh, there are cookies. Cookies are important. But again, it's a far broader concept and a far broader issue that needs to be discussed, which is when individual identifiers exist for individuals, how does this impact on their privacy and which data is interconnected and stored about them in ways that can then later be used in in ways that can't be imagined even when the database is first created. And this specifically relates not just to unique identifiers, but to concepts of anonymization as well. There's an ongoing debate in the academic literature. We haven't yet found the perfect or the ideal solution for anonymization, although there are national legal protections which exempt companies from liability as a result of this. And there's an enormous difficulty if we don't have a good technical solution to anonymize data it may be that we're giving legal protections to companies that aren't actually developing any benefits to privacy, even though they claim to be anonymizing data. And then lastly, there's uh, one or two other points that I'd like to mention very briefly. One is the increase linked to these individual identifiers and databases in processing capacity. So the fact that processes are getting incredibly fast, that the, we still have Moore's law in place and the, the amount of processing capacity is exploding still, even now, and as a result of that, it becomes easier every day to process information that already exists but previously wasn't processable. Now, deep packet inspection is just one example of that, where processing capacity has become fast enough and storage has become fast enough that you can now live process certain types of information. But it goes in many aspects of data processing and indeed to technologies like facial recognition, which are becoming increasingly normal. And for anybody here who has a Mac at the table, um, it's now built into your Mac. So, um, uh, if it becomes uh, that ubiquitous, you can imagine what large data centers are doing with it. And to, to finish on an, an issue which is particularly close to my heart, you'll find in the book um, a graph on the last page of the, the examples of privacy, which I believe shows extremely well the, the dangers that are out there. It's a, a very short pie graph which was taken from the logs that came from devices which are based in Syria. And these are the, the access logs collected by an NGO, Telecomix, which had been taken from Syrian surveillance systems. So these are systems that were observing all aspects of people's daily lives. If you're looking, I believe it's page 47. And I think you can see extremely well uh, the extent to which all aspects of your, your individual life, whether it's social networking, uh, 49, excuse me, page 49, social networking, radio, P2P file sharing, but also very basic personal uh, things that you would do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's 
phrased here as adult themes, but in the same way as blogs, research, e-commerce, dating, that essentially all aspects of the human communicative life are stored there, and they're stored on government organized servers. So this is just one tool that has been extremely common in the development of state repression and control over uh, individuals, and this is a very specific privacy issue. It's not just a surveillance issue, it's not just a freedom of expression issue, it also links to the individual lives and the individual spaces of people. So what that means for national legislation, it may be difficult in certain parts of the world, but uh, I think Andrew can provide more comparative examples of how these scenarios can be developed. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Ben. So just to kind of uh, briefly summarize our overall recommendations and conclusions, but a, a couple of remarks before that. There's an obvious tension between freedom uh, of expression and privacy. And the, the overall approach that we clearly recommend is that uh, uh, implied by international human rights law that if there's a clash between privacy and free expression, you choose the right that best serves the public interest. That's not a necessarily an easy test to apply. It has to be looked at in every circumstance. So in one society, for example, while a politician's personal finances may be of legitimate public interest, there may be no reason to regard their immediate family's finances of immediate public interest. If, however, that politician's family has accumulated, let's say, $1.5 billion worth of assets in the previous 20 years, then maybe that is legitimate for those, family, for those family considerations to be considered and not regarded as private interests. These are the kind of balances that any society, I think, has to take on board. The second cautionary note we'd suggest is, and we noticed it in a number of the literature that we looked at, is there's often a confusion between data protection and privacy, or rather an elision between data protection and privacy, and they're not the same things. Uh, not all data is private, and not all, not all privacy issues are data. And so you shouldn't think that just because you've done data protection, you've actually made adequate provision to defend people's privacy. And in fact, many of the data protection regimes we've looked at, while they have individual public interest overrides in relation to specific circumstances, do not have a general public interest override which enable a public interest to be defended even in, you know, in extreme circumstances where the data protection laws should imply a degree of privacy. So I, I think we should separate out the concept of privacy and data protection and see them as very, very intimately related and, and extensively overlapping, but not the same thing. So we make a number of suggestions. One is at the level of constitutional protection. We do think there is value in having constitutional protection for privacy. Clearly, in the drafting of that privacy protection, that, that constitutional protection, privacy needs to accommodate uh, freedom of expression uh, and the right to information, because these are potentially competing rights. But it, it's as, as the setting of a normative framework, we think there is clear value in, in having constitutional protection for privacy, uh, and that's relatively rare in the world. Secondly, we see the primary legal remedy for privacy uh, violations as being the civil law, uh, which should be defined appropriately, uh, explicitly, or through court interpretation to cover information where there's a reasonable expectation on behalf of the individual that that information is private, and again, allowing for a public interest balancing where freedom of expression concerns are involved. Generally, we do not favor the application of the criminal law to the protection of privacy, although we think there is an argument uh, for the application of the criminal law in very sensitive areas such as telecommunications and banking where privacy is actually essential to the operations of those systems. But again, those protections can't be absolute and where, for example, the surveillance of telecommunications is regarded as necessary for law enforcement purposes, we think there should be both strong substantive grounds like a requirement to produce serious evidence that there is a need for that surveillance and uh, procedural grounds normally involving a court order for such surveillance to take place. But again, we do not favor general criminal protections, sanctions for the protection of privacy. We do think data protection regimes are very important and they should cover issues such as the right of us to consent to the way our data is used by those who collect it, our rights to access and correct data which we know to be and can demonstrate to be inaccurate, uh, certain obligations on data controllers to handle data in a certain way and to provide rights of redress if that data is misused or leaked 
or made available in, in ways that violate the original terms under which that data has been given. We place quite a strong emphasis on corporate self-regulation and the obligations of companies handling data, particularly big internet companies, to consider how they're going to respect their data's privacy. And to that end, we've, we've suggested a, a framework for examination which has been developed by a consortium involving a number of US NGOs and the not-for-profit uh, uh, browser company Mozilla, which we've detailed on page 114, which sets out what we think is a very comprehensive framework that companies could adopt ha in the internet world handling people's data. And we think if that, if that rubric was followed, that would be very strong. In the absence of, obviously this is only applicable to certain types of companies, but we think overall the RUGGY framework gives a very good basis for companies to start to think about not just privacy, but the free expression and right to information obligations that they need to carry. And finally, I think we would say we can't escape the obligations that we have as users to protect our own privacy. At the end of the day, we cannot infantilize ourselves and expect a combination of companies governments and public agencies to do all the work for us. There are now available, widely available, perfectly free, very good encryption and privacy tools that we can use both to track how our privacy is being violated and to protect that privacy. Mostly we do not choose to use them. Mostly we're still very confused about the internet between it being a means of communication when we're emailing somebody and a means of publication when we use a social website or put information out there. We need to understand that distinction and realize that the internet, which functions as both, needs to be treated with a great deal of caution when we choose to put our personal information out there. Very interesting research by the OpenNet Initiative shows that, for example, privacy tools which are available are only used by about 3% of the population who have access to them. The vast majority of people do not choose to even use basic encryption in the way they handle their communication. So although we think the clear responsibility with government and corporations to handle our data is there, at the end of the day, we have responsibilities too that we need to exercise if we want our privacy to be protected. Thank you, Guy. Uh, thank you so much uh, to uh, Andrew and Ben for summarizing the issues in the book. Uh, for those of you who don't have copies, there should be copies here still, and there will be some copies at the UNESCO stand. And it is also on the UNESCO website at unesco.org slash new slash internet hyphen privacy and hyphen FOE. Uh, I'll repeat that. So in unesco.org slash new slash internet hyphen privacy hyphen and hyphen FOE. Otherwise, you can just Google it. <laughs> right. Uh, let's move on to our, our, our next speakers. Uh, and I'm sorry that uh, I, I need to ask them to keep it tight to the five minutes that we did uh, allocate them. Uh, Lee Hibbard from the Council of Europe unfortunately cannot make it, but uh, the Council has made Sophie Kwasny available, and we're grateful for that. Uh, she's the head of the Data Protection Unit in the Council of Europe and has extensive experience as a lawyer dealing with these kinds of issues. Sophie, over to you. Thank you very much, Guy. Thank you to the UNESCO for uh, inviting the Council of Europe to contribute to this workshop. Um, the Council of Europe, as a regional organization, has been involved with those questions uh, for over 60 years. Um, the, the triptych we're working on is uh, human rights, rule of law and democracy and as human rights our main pillar is the European Convention on Human Rights which precisely deals with those two rights, right to freedom of expression, article 10 of the convention and article 8 for the right to private life. So this is something that the Council of Europe and the court, that uh, uh, is, the, is the, the, the judicial safeguard of, of the convention, uh, have been working on. I would like to comment the, uh, the work of the authors of this report uh, um, in really reproducing uh, uh, most of, the, of the, the key issues which have been raised uh, by the European Court in its case law in precisely uh, exercising this balance and this taste uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you 
you underline that it is a delicate balance to decide where the boundary between free expression and privacy lies, but, uh, but one the courts are used to negotiating. And indeed, um, I think it's extensively reproduced in your report, page 55 onwards, the criteria that the European Court of Human Rights has been developing on a case-by-case -case basis to assess which rights should prevail. Um, the two rights, right to freedom of expression and uh, right to privacy, are qualified rights. Uh, there is no uh, hierarchy in those rights. They have an equal value. One is not systematically prevailing on the other. Um, also, they are not absolute. Uh, if you look at both those articles in the Convention, Article 8 and Article 10, you will see that the rights are, um, um, are laid down, but that there are also, also conditions to limitations and exercise of those rights, which are mentioned in the Convention, uh, and under very, very strict uh, uh, conditions. They are, they are repeated here in the report. Uh, I will just mention them briefly. It has to be the interference, the limitation to the right have to be prescribed by law. That's the first criteria. It has to be necessary in a democratic society in the interest of, and then there is a list of limitative grounds, and they, this is really a closed list. Uh, they cannot be uh, uh, extended. Um, one thing I would like now to mention more closely, and it was said, uh, data protection is not coinciding fully with privacy and vice versa. And it's precisely for this reason that uh, over 30 years ago, we developed a convention specifically addressing the question of uh, data processing and protecting the individuals in regard of data processing. Um, at that time, 30 years ago, the, the balancing of this right, the right to data protection, as an enabler of other rights, was not made very, very clearly. And we are now modernizing the convention, and this is something that came, uh, that was really underlined in our work, uh, that uh, the right to privacy, and here more specifically, the right to data protection, had, um, had to be articulated uh, in, uh, in an environment where it would sustain and enable the exercise of other rights. Um, I will read to you the formulation that we are now proposing that would be in the preamble uh, of, the, of the Convention 108 on Data Protection, reminding that the right to protection of personal data is to be considered in respect of its role in society and that it has to be reconciled with other human rights and fundamental freedoms, including freedom of expression. So there is really an express reference to the need to balance those rights, and that's key. And that will be in the preamble. We will also naturally have uh, an exemption uh, related to the uh, um, uh, exercise of the principles linked to freedom of expression, and that's also something that was made clear in the report, of course. Um, another important uh, point I would like to make, which is uh, um, connected to the topic today, in this work of modernization of the Convention, we ask ourselves whether we should uh, expressly grant a right to be forgotten. Um, this is something that is being done uh, at the level of the European Union in the proposed uh, regulation of the Commission. On the contrary, the experts uh, that considered the question came to the conclusion that uh, what already exists, the rights which are already safeguarded, um, um, rights uh, of information, the, the uh, accuracy of the data, the length of uh, preservation of the data, and the right uh, um, to have your data corrected. All those rights put together, when they are uh, effectively enforced, and it's true, it, it's, it's a problem, um, uh, precisely provide uh, for, for the mechanism that this right to be forgotten uh, is trying to put in place. So we will not be uh, um, granting this right uh, expressly, but consider that a good articulation of what exists should, should be protecting the individuals. Um, another important work I would like to mention that we have uh, carried out uh, uh, very recently, we have adopted two recommendations uh, uh, on the protection of human rights with regard to social networking services on one side and the other side related to search engines. And there again, when we were trying to tackle this question of human rights for those two particular sectors, um, the question of balancing 
freedom of expression and, and privacy and right to data protection was crucial. Um, if I can only uh, mention one of the recommendations uh, concerning social networking services, it was indeed uh, recommended that anonymity, pseudonymity be provided to the users of those services. And uh, I underline that this is not necessarily the case depending on, on the social platform you're on. Um, this, this was basically for the uh, normative, uh, normative work of the Council of Europe in setting standards. Uh, I would also like to give another example of the way we are trying uh, to, to reach this balance, uh, which is also one of the points of the report, self-regulation. Um, and uh, this year we have been actively working in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine uh, recently adopted a law on data protection and the media sector reacted very strongly to this law. Uh, and we have been working with the media sector to draft uh, recommendations with them. Uh, it's been, uh, um, it's, it's their work. The ethics committee and, uh, and trade unions uh, have drafted those recommendations on the right to private life uh, in media coverage. Coverage. And uh, I think it's a good also example of what you mentioned before. Uh, depending on the legal uh, on the legal system and on the culture, uh, some information may be published, whereas others uh, might be more more problematic. Thank you again very much for this work and for uh, and for uh, enabling us to uh, to work together on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sophie. Uh, our next uh, contributor is uh, my colleague on the right, uh, Ms. Katitza Rodriguez, International Rights Director, Electronic Freedom, uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation based in the USA. And uh, she's also got a, a legal background um, and she um, works a lot on international privacy issues. She focuses on cyber security at the intersection of privacy, freedom of expression and copyright. And she's a member of the advisory board of Privacy International. Over to you. Thank you, um, uh, Guy. Um, today I would like a little to react. Um, it's off? Oh, yeah. um, hello? Yeah? Okay. Um, I would like to react to what our colleagues have said um, during the presentation of the book. Um, we are both uh, mentioned that our digital footprints, uh, we are leaving far more detailed footprints in our online environment. But what does it mean? Maybe we should uh, a little think about what, uh, what people can do or com uh, can do with all this information that we are leaving. And usually um, is now possible with that amount of information to directly observe people's relationship and interactions and even to make interference about their intimate and protect, protected relationships. Um, we can examine uh, millions of people's communications and rapidly identify everyone in a population who has communicated with a particular person in particular language or even on a particular topic of your particular, particular vocabulary. We can track a particular personal physical movement almost all the time, or almost everyone's movement, and make interference about professional, sexual, political, and religious activities. We can draw conclusions about religious, political, and sexual interests, belief, and attitudes from individuals associations and internet traffic. We can also routinely retain data for decades so that even statements and interactions that have passed out of human beings, living memory can be searched, analyzed and recall. We can do all about simultaneously. This is a lot of things that it can be done with uh, data. Um, this is recognized privacy as a fundamental human rights. Um, and even the Human Rights Committee in general comment num num number 16 recognizes that the core data protection principles are encapsulated in the right to privacy, but also acknowledge that there is an emerging right distinct uh, as a fundamental right. Um, that's some uh, uh, comment I would like to make upon the, the book. 
Then on um, page uh, more uh, 106, 107, uh, seven, uh, when it talk about the limitations to the right to privacy, uh, Article 17 of the ICCPR uh, is flexible enough to enable, the, to enable necessary, legitimate, and proportionate restrictions to the right to privacy. And this has been um, stated by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms Against Counterterrorism. Um, however, despite this, governments are still failing to comply or justify why a particular aim is legitimate justification for the restriction to the right to privacy. For instance, we have that several countries have threatened to ban or regulate Skype and encrypted web mail because those governments could not wiretype them through its systems. Several countries, including Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and India, have all threatened to ban and encrypt BlackBerry service unless uh, that company hang over encryption keys or move servers into their country to permit local wiretapping. Uh, the EUAE have also called and seat the U.S. government Kalia lawful interception law as a justification for doing so. Um, this tendency to adopt legal obligations to build in intercept capacity, capacity into internet services, such as Facebook or Gmail, is also a trend that is being discussed in democratic countries like UK and Canada. Um, this is why it's, it's important. There's many other problems also about, for instance, voluntary sharing. Uh, we have seen also that even countries uh, who have uh, need a court order to um, make a, have access uh, to communications data, uh, sometimes uh, they, the law does not provide any um, provide immunity if the company decide to voluntarily sharing the data with the police. If the police, instead of provide a, no, uh, a court warrant, go and knock at the door and hang over the data. Uh, we have seen also um, numerous ways of um, ability to for one stop access when the cloud is centralized and it's um, it centralizes in one amount of personal information. This concentration of information, uh, it's a huge amount of money, uh, um, a huge amount of, sorry, uh, personal data. Um, it could just make easy for governments to access it. it. Um, so we see that there is a lot in international law, but there is no detail, um, detail specifications of which are those specific limitations to the right to privacy. There are court decisions, it's true, but it's not all over the world. And I think the more privacy protection baseline, uh, the more, you, as soon as we have privacy protection globally, data can flow uh, among countries easily. Uh, we need that protection against government governments, um, not only data protection, but also privacy vis-a-vis -vis the government. So for that reason, some organizations um, have been drafting uh, international uh, due process principles where we are trying to go more into the granularity of what these limitations, not only the limitations to the right to privacy means, but also um, which other obligations need to be included in any surveillance law. So which is Usually, for instance, the Cyber Grand Treaty or other surveillance law, they are really focused on give more new surveillance powers to law enforcement. But the limitations, there haven't been discussions of which are those limitations. The legality principle, the necessity principle, the adequacy principle, and the proportionality. Um, um, so we have detailed this. Um, among others, like for instance, transparency, user, user notification. If for instance, um, your data has been request, uh, uh, the government is requesting your data to a provider, the provider should be able to, well, the government should be able, but also the provider notify the user. But uh, sometimes it's not possible because there is gag orders. So we hope that service providers can challenge those requests. And if they said that it's not possible, they should justify why it's not. 
possible, what are you going to interfere with in the investigation? We also need more transparency about government surveillance. So all this debate is really secret. And we have little information about how governments are handling our data, uh, what they are doing with them. Uh, we just see recently two companies, uh, Twitter and Google, who are uh, reporting uh, government access requests. But it's not enough. Uh, we need much more information to understand what's the whole implications of, of uh, access to our data. Um, not only the legal request, but this also voluntary sharing of perhaps international cooperation among law enforcement. So see, this is uh, some of the topics we have uh, covered in the principles. And you can access the principles in the website Democrat, Democrat, no, necessary and proportionate.net. Um, the website, again, just for the records, is uh, www.necessaryandproportionate.net. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Katitsa. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Jeran Unel, uh, an instructor at Bill Kent University Faculty of Law in Turkey. She is also ha has a legal background and a lot of experience in these issues. Over to you, Jeran. Is it okay? Oh, okay, I can hear myself as well. Uh, again, thanks for having us here and thanks for preparing this brilliant report. It's, it's really hard work and we really appreciate it. It's, uh, as the report also uh, states, the balance of interest, the law is all about balancing interests and uh, which, one to be, which one is going to be prevailed, privacy or freedom of expression. And how difficult to achieve this balance is, n is as difficult as uh, in the online world and the offline world. The, the challenge is still the same. Uh, if you have a look at the legal framework and the legal source of privacy protection, uh, more or less we have a similar structure. We have constitutions and constitutional provisions. Again, I think that it's really important. And constitutional provisions uh, protecting privacy is also symbolically important because they might not have as practical effects as uh, national law provisions, but they have a symbolic uh, importance and significance. And then we have civil law provisions, mainly torts, protecting privacy, and criminal law provisions, which are all also questionable, and data protection rules. And we have international legal documents, uh, international agreements and conventions, they, which are binding, however, mostly not directly applicable, it needs national laws to be enacted for uh, their implementation and needs harmonization. And we have soft law and guidelines, which are not binding in themselves. And it's what well, also strikes me the most, although many of the countries have more or less the same legal frameworks and even the sa same rules, uh, how these rules are interpreted and implemented are really very, very uh, significantly different from each other. So this is also really important. Another point, uh, no matter how good or even perfect legal rules you have, uh, simply legal provisions are never sufficient for effective privacy protection. They should be supplemented by uh, industrial self-regulation, which I believe it's really, really uh, crucial for having flexible rules, tailor-made rules, uh, which are easier to adapt to technologic developments and all because it's really hard to make technology-proof legal provisions. And also multi-stakeholderism is important and inclusive participation amongst different stakeholder groups. Uh, when it's done effectively, we can have more effective uh, privacy protection. International cooperation should definitely be enhanced. and. Also, privacy by design principles should be incorporated and implemented. Uh, again, what I think most important facts uh, above all, the sanctions for, private, uh, for protecting privacy must be preventative rather than punitive because uh, when you have a privacy violation, most of the damage is already done and no matter how uh, good mechanisms, uh, how 
good uh, redress mechanisms you have uh, once it's violated. Uh, the, the most of the damage is already already done. Uh, and again, most importantly, education is a key to enhance uh, effective privacy protection and raise user awareness uh, to make sure that they don't make themselves extra, extra vulnerable, which already they are. Uh, simple, effective and practical tools and policies may be available for the users. And also, uh, it must be kept in mind that English and French are not necessarily the dominating languages of the Internet any longer, so a multilingual policies, easy to follow, easy to apply, easy to understand and practical. This is real, really, really important. Uh, also, the right to be forgotten. I think whether or not to explicitly recognize it as an individual right is another discussion, but uh, more or less uh, it can be also discussed under privacy since it derives also from uh, the general right of personality which is recognized in most of the civil law jurisdictions and it derives from the right to informational self-determination which is mainly the underlying principle of all the data protection rules and also consent uh, qualified how to provide uh, sufficient consent for uh, processing of personal data is also really, really important. What else do I have? Again, the shift from uh, traditional internet to mobile is crucial. And only, I think, uh, industrial self-regulation, effective industrial self-regulation uh, should work together with governments. And uh, tools to provide security are also tricky because when an average user thinks that, okay, this is a policy to provide my security and to, this is going to make me uh, browse safer on the internet, it also comes with a lot of privacy implications. And again, uh, same applies for govern government regulation as well. Whenever they're trying to provide internet security, there might be some risks regarding privacy and I don't think the users are, or an average person is uh, aware of this catch. Okay, I think more or less. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jiren. Uh, we now move to uh, Gabriel uh, Guillemin, is that correct? Guillemin, legal officer of Article 19. And uh, she joined Article 19 as legal officer last year. And uh, she's been working as research and case processing lawyer at the European Court of Human Rights uh, prior to that. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Guy. Um, um, I'd like to begin uh, by uh, commending uh, all the work um, um, that's been done in relation uh, to this report and um, how it very well maps out um, the key issues uh, that come up um, in relation to freedom of expression and um, privacy online. Um, briefly, I'd just like to make some general remarks but, but also come back to, to some of the recommendations uh, um, in the report, although uh, that could be uh, relatively fast since uh, there are very many very good recommendations uh, in it. Um, uh, one thing that uh, struck me reading the report uh, was um, that for me it brings out perhaps um, three uh, types of uh, relationships. As been said uh, by many others, uh, the internet and many of the services that are available online, such as search or social platforms, have been a, a game changer. Uh, for a number of reasons, including um, the fact that, uh, on the one hand, um, there is this anonymity online which has enabled um, this uh, explosion in, in terms of freedom of expression and communication uh, online. At the same time, because it's digital, there's this uh, digital print that uh, Katitsa was um, talking about. So now that uh, create, I mean, that creates perhaps um, two uh, issues. One is um, in relation to government and uh, law enforcement, uh, because there is this trail, um, it be and because um, uh, 
criminal activity is also carried out uh, using uh, online services. Um, that sort of uh, creates um, this um, like law enforcement wanting to get access to this enormous pool of data. Um, and now we're seeing um, increasingly um, uh, states pushing for laws um, that, that would um, allow uh, the surveillance of uh, individuals on a massive scale. And I know there are some experts here who could uh, uh, talk to you about the situation in the UK, for example, the UK Communications Data Bill. And so that uh, creates problem in terms of um, access to the enormous pool of data and uh, the legal procedures uh, to, to get access to it. And this has been referred to uh, in the report and, uh, for example, the importance of uh, court orders in, in this regard. So there is uh, this issue of um, government and how they get access to that data. Um, uh, the other aspect uh, in relation to, to freedom of expression is that obviously because um, the, the easier it becomes for, for um, governments to get access to that data, it has an enormous chilling effect um, on uh, freedom of expression. So I just wanted to, to highlight this. Um, another relationship uh, which is um, examined very extensively in the report is that of um, individuals and the companies that uh, hold their data and so the privacy settings and I think that the report has much to command in, in, in relation to um, its uh, recommendations um, uh, relating for example I mean there's uh, data protection on the one hand but there's also um, self-regulation. Um, Finally, I think um, the, uh, the uh, internet has also changed very much um, the, the relationship almost b between uh, users. And I'm thinking of um, the example that was mentioned earlier of um, g this, uh, like someone going to a party and then um, the, uh, the um, a photo is taken and then it's, uh, it's posted um, online. Now, I think generally, uh, usually there would be a, a framework in place, um, but, but I think the, the internet mainly po po has posed enormous challenges um, in terms of uh, enforcement, um, because once it's out there, it is out there. Now, I, 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 I part uh, with uh, Ms. Unal uh, in relation to preventive measures, because this very much reminds me of the, the case of Max Mosley uh, against the UK, where, um, um, as you may know, uh, m um, m there was a video of m m Mr. Mosley engaging in uh, sexual activities, and that this was uh, unknown to him, and that this became widely available, and um, he went to the courts and and won uh, his case, and they found there was a clear breach of privacy. Now, Mr. Mosley has been. Um, continuing to, 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 um, to go all around the world because despite the fact that um, he, he won in the UK courts, um, you know, the information is out there, so, um, so it, it's still possible to get access to, to, uh, to, to the video. So I think here um, what Mr. Mosley was arguing for more specifically uh, uh, in the UK course and then subsequently especially in Strasbourg was in relation to pre-notification um, and, and because the, the rationale was that um, obviously the first thing to do is to prevent the information from getting out there um, but uh, I'd just like to remind in this regard that uh, the court found that this was actually um, not in compliance with the convention and that this, was ha this, that this would have a massive um, chilling effect um, but now there's still the question of, okay, so what happens when um, the, the information is still available? And here, I, I think if I understand correctly, the recommendations in the report is um, that when um, there is a civil remedy um, and uh, it is possible to obtain damages, um, uh, we would think that at Article 19 that this would be sufficient so that the the um, the um, it it is not although the uh, individual may seek redress and try and get an an injunction to to pre prevent the material from uh, uh, being spread further. Um, just looking at the, the the way the internet is and and 
what it would mean uh, to, to, to have perfect enforcement. I just think that it would have too much negative consequences for freedom of expression online and, um, and it, that it is also uh, very impractical. Also, it raises questions to how would you go about uh, enforcing that? And um, since the prospect would be um, uh, massive filtering uh, to try and identify this information, um, the, this is um, something which we don't think uh, would be compatible with freedom of expression. So I'll just go back briefly to um, some of the recommendations of the report and um, I just thought that um, the recommendations in relation to education and, um, and putting also some responsibility on users is, is an important one. Um, I think there's definitely a role for um, companies to uh, educate about how to, to, to use their privacy settings and um, um, I think I'll stop here because I don't have very much time left um, and uh, we should open the floor for more questions. But I think this is uh, particularly important when we see uh, increasingly people sometimes being prosecuted for what they, what they say, for example, on Facebook, and they, have, they don't seem to be aware that this could lead to serious consequences. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gabriela. Uh, well, the, the elephant in the room uh, is, is not here. Um, <laughs> Bill Etchingson sends apologies because he has a scheduling conflict uh, from Bill Etchingson from uh, Google, but uh, he has sent uh, Max uh, Senges uh, in his place. So, welcome to the elephant. <laughs> Hello, yeah, and uh, thanks for having me. Um, as um, Guy just explained, I just jumped in here, so I've um, had uh, the opportunity to um, think about this while um, you were preparing your notes. I hope um, I can contribute some um, different perspective, obviously, um, and uh, as you will expect, um, and uh, that will be also one of my first points, um, that as a um, uh, corporation and one of the platform providers, we have um, a slightly different perspective on some of the things that uh, are raised in the report, and um, actually I'd uh, like to invite you to um, work with more private sector um, uh, companies and, and actors if you prepare a report next year because I think that perspective is uh, is not really present so it's um, not multi or it is multi stakeholder but uh, one important stakeholder is missing and I think um, the report would benefit or this work would benefit from a more balanced um, perspective um, also I was uh, surprised to find that um, I would um, assess about 80% about um, in the report is about privacy, while um, there is um, a lot of freedom of expression issues, and this is the, the first um, contribution I want to make and uh, really raise that I think um, one um, aspect of the freedom of expression online um, debate and developments that we see is that, um, yes, the Internet is an amazing tool to um, publish and enable everybody with a mobile phone basically to find a global audience almost immediately and report etc but um, what about the tolerance to receive that freedom of expression and I think that is an area where um, a lot of work needs to be done to think about intercultural uh, tolerance and tolerance of different opinions I think uh, a stream that has not been uh, explored to the point where it's um, really um, yeah, getting us to, to a place where we included in the media literacy training right now we're still focused on um, skills how to use it but that also includes you know understanding that your um, uh, statements will be there for um, everybody to see etc so privacy and uh, publicness is, is of course um, two sides of the same um, uh, tool and uh, the internet is everything you love and everything you hate at the same time so you find um, all these things and uh, it's just one click away and and I think that's uh, really important to start to think about. Um, Katsitsa um, has um, used a lot of expressions where we say, uh, where she said, we can do this and we can do that. And uh, most of the examples that uh, you used were obviously the um, scary ones, right? The ones that um, come with um, a uh, really valuable um, thing that is data. And I think um, 
again, it can be used for positive and for negative things. And I just want to um, contribute that um, you know all of this is developing, and we see a very prospering um, uh, industry and, and many happy users because these services ha are beneficial. You can um, uh, you know find information that really meets your needs immediately. That is something that a lot of people enjoy. Basically, I guess everybody in the room also. Um, and th there are some things that we are just emerging on things like uh, the value of data, the big data. Andrew referred to flu trends, um, uh, things, analysis that can be done, benefits that can be reaped. That um, you know, if we put on um, the um, uh, privacy barrier too hard, um, uh, we will not be able to develop and think about. Um, I think also about e-learning solutions where um, uh, we really get personalized materials to help you learn faster, learn better, learn in more interesting ways. So um, again, here I think a more balanced view where we look first at the opportunities and then we see how we can um, contain the threats is, is the right approach. Um, to share a little story with you um, that I think uh, hits the, the um, mark of this quite well, Jimbo Wales, the um, uh, creator of Wikipedia, tells the story that there is a difference between social media and the traditional way we build systems. And my understanding is that a lot of the um, uh, concerns that are raised here are actually still um, living in this old traditional way, the way we used to build or we built ATMs. That is the way to uh, think about all the possible misuses and make sure that nobody can misuse them. However, social media and systems like Wikipedia, which um, I think has quite rightly re been referred to as Wikipedia doesn't work in theory, but it works in practice. So we should really go out and see what works and then experiment and um, do pilot projects and then contain the threats. So um, he compared Wikimedia with a restaurant. Um, and you know, you have a fork, you have a knife, you could basically go and stab your neighbor without any problem, but nobody does that because actually humans are not as bad as some of the threats that you see um, are working. However, and I'll uh, go into that in a moment, um, there is of course peer-to-peer -peer privacy infringements and um, chapter that I think is missing in this um, report. Um, but as I said, I'm, I'm gonna go into that in a second. I think, um, Basically, we are living online lives, and some of the aspects that um, are brought up here, like uh, pervasive use of um, um, uh, <clears throat> of the the location-based services, um, you know that that is something that really helps us a lot to find different um, spots. When we are in a new city like Baku, we can actually wander around and use Google Maps and other tools that are uh, quite helpful. So, um, I think. It's, it's really a mixture between, on the one hand, understanding what you want to have private, and I think there you need a trusted environment, and that is what uh, services like Google try to provide, right? We are um, putting security of the data and resistance to government requests very high up on our list. It's, um, it's, it's some of the threats you're describing, or most of them, are actually about governments gaining access to the data, and uh, the discussion that uh, seems to be uh, present in this report for quite a big um, aspect is, okay, the data per se is a bad thing. We should minimize data collection, and I think that is a, a wrong approach. I think we should have as much data as possible, but make sure that it's in trusted environments. So um, <clears throat> I think um, taking a public position, as um, the, a colleague from Article 19 described, um, is one of the most important aspects of a public life, of a, a vivid democracy, and um, <clears throat> to, um, have people go out in public and understand, as Frank de la Rue says, the internet as the um, public plaza, as the um, place where people interact and have that as a default should be our um, continued perspective that we want to have a public debate online, that privacy is not the default because otherwise we have a retreat to privacy um, which has been studied over and over again is actually a retreat out of public life and out of uh, democratic participation. We are here in Azerbaijan where um, it, we can really see how important it is to be able to go out and have that public discussion. And again, um, on these platforms, that uh, these trusted environments, we see that uh, on Facebook and Google+, Plus, etc., people are uploading the pictures um, from each other, and that is where the user education has to happen and um, where no policy basically holds, but only human rights and, and uh, understanding of, of uh, shared values, etc. <clears throat> 
So again, a little bit on um, the um, line of resistance to government requests. Um, I think um, other companies should um, join Google and uh, Twitter in providing transparency reports so we really know what is going on and be more um, more um, detailed about uh, these kind of requests. And I would also like to um, repeat the recommendation for everybody to look at necessary and proportionate.net, the uh, website that Katsisa um, mentioned. It's a, it's a rather new development that um, some um, still in discussion, but is ready. I mean, there's a group that is ready to discuss this. How do we um, actually have a due process when um, we're talking about government requests? I think in um, many countries, this is already on a pretty good scale, but obviously there's also many, many countries where a lot needs to be desired. Um, and I think that uh, is, a, is an important aspect to uh, look at. Uh, lastly, I'd like to comment on the, uh, the right to be forgotten, which uh, seems um, a very um, strange idea, to be honest. Um, it, it's a, a new idea in history that you can, um, you know, sort of cross out something that has historically happened. Uh, it's very bad for um, the way we can look at archives and uh, historians can interpret what has happened in, a, in, a, uh, in an area, and I'm happy to give uh, an example in a, in a second. Um, but it's also technologically almost impossible. It, it has been uh, conceived by um, people who sort of liked the idea but didn't come up with a concrete um, example on, on how that is supposed to work. And if it is going to work, I, th I believe it will be a lot of burden on the user to manage that, um, um, yeah, to manage that uh, feature. And um, at least um, I, I don't see, um, you know, people are not using the, the privacy um, settings in the moment to the degree that we'd like them to use them, right? It's a, it's a question of media literacy. So to add to this complexity um, and have them set a um, default date when uh, information um, is, is, is not valid anymore, etc., seems... Uh, at least a daunting task. So again, I think this is about almost rewriting history. And I'd like to tell a short story. We had a case in Germany where um, uh, a bouncer in, in Hamburg at the Repabahn um, had a nickname that was kind of racist, um, involved something like nigger in the word, and he was quite happy about that. And there were rappers using his name and uh, talking about him, and he felt it was quite cool. But uh, then he decided that he doesn't like that idea anymore, and he didn't want to be called that anymore. And he actually went and he um, tried and successfully tried to have that nickname removed from newspaper articles, obviously not in the physical well world, because you can't uh, retra uh, retract all the paper copies, but he did succeed in having that name crossed out in uh, the archives of um, the newspapers. And I think that is a very dangerous environment where um, people are basically going back and changing um, the, the discourse and uh, I really wonder whether this is the way um, we're on the road we want to walk down and with that I'd like to close right uh, th thank you so much for that uh, uh, Max uh, our last uh, contributor now is um, uh, David Suter who's the founding and managing director of ICT development associates um, he's also a visiting professor of communications management at the University of Strathclyde in Scotland and he's also a visiting fellow at uh, LSE, and I think he's also here wearing an APC hat. But I am can indeed. That. Um, yes, I'm substituting for Joy Lidicott from APC, and I have only a few seconds, I think, probably. Uh, so let me make a few points on behalf of, uh, or at least what I think APC would, would say. Firstly, I think APC would very strongly welcome this report for two reasons. Um, it's exactly the kind of sophisticated research-based analysis that APC feels has been missing from a lot of this debate. Um, and secondly, it's coming out of the human rights community rather than out of the internet community. Um, and uh, APC feels strongly that that, that is, is very important to have that uh, uh, to have these issues led by discourse from both sides. Um, secondly, um, I'd pick up on three things which um, I think it reinforce APC would strongly reinforce from its own work. Um, firstly, uh, the report is placing freedom of expression within a broader rights perspective, a broader rights context. Um, on the whole, we, uh, we feel that freedom of expression has rightly been emphasized, but that's been in a context of underemphasis on other, uh, other rights, in particular privacy, but other rights as well, including those which you can find in, which are found in other clauses of the EDHR and the conventions, and in CDOR and in the CRC. Um, secondly, um, it's emphasizing um, the 
uh, it's, it's seeing the internet not as an agent of rights but as a complex uh, opportunity and challenge for rights, uh, negative and positive. It always strikes me that in the 20th century literature and cinema saw communication, digital communications as dystopian, then the internet came and we saw them as utopian, actually it's both and it's complex. And thirdly, it sees the internet as uh, changing, not static. Um, uh, and the changes which have taken place over the past five years are so substantial that actually the analysis we'd have of the Internet's impact on rights five years ago is no longer relevant today. Um, I want to take four very quick points from some research which I've done for APC, which is to uh, interview senior human rights professionals about their perceptions of the Internet. So I think four points that come out of that that are resonant with this discussion. Um, first, and this is a qualifier, talk to human rights, senior human rights professionals about the internet and they say, yes, it's, we, we know it's really important, we're using it, but we have no time to analyze it. We are far too busy dealing with the issues that are within our mandates. So we don't have a, a serious analysis of the impact of the internet on our fields. We think it's important, we need to do that. Um, so with that caveat in mind, they then I think said very much the sort of things that are in this report. So I'd say strong positive impact on freedom of expression, freedom of association, and freedom of information. Um, yes, new types of violations within that, but a strong net positive impact on those three rights. However, an equally strong perception uh, that the internet has threatened rights of privacy in a way that um, had not been seen since those rights were, were articulated. Um, and that that was a perception of violations uh, or of threats, sorry, from government, from business, and from other individuals. Um, and be beneath that, I think, a sense that people have not adapted their behavior to new parameters of privacy, which are resulting from the Internet. Um, also, I think, a sense that, uh, that, a very strong sense, that the balance has been disrupted and that neither rights agencies nor individuals have yet understood how to handle that disruption to the balance between freedom of expression and privacy and indeed other rights within the rights regime. Um, uh, so those I think are, are very consistent uh, with that. Third point would be that a slightly different thing, one additional point which is that there was a perception that online the instruments that governments could use for normal law enforcement and the instruments that they could use for oppression were very closely similar. Offline they're quite different and that this was a, a, a nuance that needed more exploration. And finally there was a strong sense that there was insufficient dialogue between rights professionals and the internet community and when the internet community was discussed there, I respond here to Max, um, it was, uh, there was an emphasis on the need to discuss with Google, with Facebook, with the other major private sector interests in the internet, not just with the natural civil society partners. So, thanks. Uh, thank you uh, so much, David. We, we are out of time. <laughs> and I, I hate to end it because I'm sure everyone has got to, more to discuss, but I think it's going to have to be over, over coffee because there's another session due to come. Is there anybody on the remote channel, though, who wants to? Okay, nobody on remote. Uh, I, I'm really sorry to do this, but it was an extremely rich discussion. I think UNESCO feels really pleased that we initiated it. It's a wonderful turnout here. I think there's huge food for thought. Uh, at UNESCO, we are very freedom of expression centric. We are not privacy international. We, we are here to protect freedom of expression. So for us, this was really useful for us to try and think, how does privacy, a valid human right in its own, how does it inter interface with our quest to push um, for freedom of expression. The URL of this, of this book, if you don't have a copy or if you want to refer to other people, uh, use Google <laughs> or DuckDuckGo if you don't want to be tracked. <laughs> uh, and uh, I just repeat the URL, unesco.org slash new slash again, internet privacy and FOE with hyphens between those words, internet privacy and FOE, FOE freedom of expression put hyphens between internet privacy and FOE. Thank you so much to all the speakers and thanks particularly to uh, the two contributors who are here. End of session then. <laughs>